Her Excellency Dame Sandra Mason, Governor General of Barbados, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, Sir Paul Altman, Chair of Campus Council, Professor Winston Moore, Deputy Principal, the University of the West Indies Cafil Campus, and he is representing our principal, Professor Eudeen Barto. Professor Clive Landis, Pro Vice Chancellor, Board Undergraduate Studies, the University of the West Indies Cafil Campus, and principal designate from August 1. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, Director of the Center for Sustainable Development, Columbia University, and family. Members of the Cabinet, Leader of the Opposition, Members of the Diplomatic Corps, Representatives of the University of the West Indies, Specially Invited Guests, Live Stream Audiences, Ladies and Gentlemen, Welcome to this Distinguished Arthur Lewis event. It is an event hosted by the, th and through the Vice Chancellor's Forum, and I'm happy to to share with you that we have a wonderful treat in store. Well, it is wonderful because we have the very rare opportunity at the University of the West Indies to welcome one of our region's sitting prime ministers to share in a conversation, a dialogue, an exchange with one of the leading uh, professors of economics uh, referred to uh, some time ago by the New York Times as one of the three most influential living economists of our time. I want to suggest to you that uh, it is an error of mine not to mention my name. I am Professor Don Marshall. I'm your master's ceremonies. You know, you don't see it on the protocol list, so then you forget yourself. But I'm sure you can forgive me for that. Uh, allow me to also at this point to outline for you the, the sequence of things as they shall unfold. Now, I'm going to have you listen to the, our Vice Chancellor, Sir Hilary Beckles of the University of the West Indies. He will offer some remarks as well as our Deputy Principal, Professor Winston Moore, who is Deputy Principal of the KFL campus. He too will offer some remarks following the Vice Chancellor's remarks. What a tremendous honor and privilege it is to participate in this program dedicated to the search for a new pedagogy, uh, new policy frameworks, and more relevant paradigms in respect of the Caribbean and other small island nation states in search of sustainable development. It is an even greater pleasure to share this space with two of the world's finest thinkers on the theme of sustainable island futures. We all know our distinguished Prime Minister, Mayor Motley, as a political leader and intellectual with a tremendous sense of care and compassion, courage and commitment to this phase of Caribbean transformation and development, which we assume to be the second fundamental phase, most of these Islands certainly in the English language speaking area uh, entering the 50th to 60th years of constitutional independence. We all know Professor Satch as a tireless intellectual gorilla in the urban jungle fighting for justice and economic development for the greater part of humanity. And this is consistent with the University of the West Indies hosting this event. Hosting this event within the context of a legacy described by President Obama when he visited with us, that this University of the West Indies 
is unmatched in terms of its commitment to struggles for economic transformation and social justice. I indeed, for the better part of its 70 years of existence, have been committed to these paradigms of economic transformation and, and, social, and social justice. The university itself has that reputation in the world for its endemic commitment to these democratizing features of modern humanity. This conversation that we're about to participate is really a conversation about relevance, about pertinence, about creating an integrity within the identities of two world thinkers and a university all within the same trajectory, seeking to achieve and fulfill those visions first expressed in our space by the legendary Sir Arthur Lewis, father of modern development economics and first vice chancellor of this our beloved university. We know of the Caribbean in its physical and political dimensions. Less known about the Caribbean is the way in which it has entered into the paradigms of economic development, certainly in the post-Columbus moments of the 15th and 16th centuries and the rise of the Caribbean at the center of global capitalism. But also at the end of the 20th century, being a pioneer in the discourse about small island developing states. The intellectual history of these journeys is now being effectively interrogated. I know about the conversation here today will add to all of that. Let's just take the concept, for example, of globalization. Those of us who have examined the Caribbean's relation to the wider world, certainly the Atlantic world, would say that the Caribbean was at the center of this globalization initiative and have been at the center of this for the better part of 500 years. But we also know globalization to be a double-edged sword that on the one hand, while it speaks to a level playing field for all nations, we also know the fundamental truth that the nation state remains the principal building block of what globalization economics is all about. And here we see the Caribbean exposed and exposing the significance of what we now call today globalization. Because on the one hand, the politics of globalization and the economics of globalization seem to be going in different directions. Yes, the Caribbean has committed to and is embraced by and has been a part of this globalization. But at the same time, we know that it's really about rich nations versus poor nations, weak versus strong nationalisms and nation states. But the truth remains that the Caribbean has been at the center of the political construct, which is now known as the West. It is also true that within this political construct of the West, the Caribbean has been in the South of this, of this economic West. And therein lies a peculiar relationship that the Caribbean has had to endure. It creates an endemic tension, both domestically and, and globally. Within the political space, for example, we've had the Haitian Revolution, the Cuba Revolution. So we have, we've had the Havana-Haiti bridge that represents a core of dissension and objection to the fundamental principles of the economics of the West. How then? Do you participate as a privileged member in the Western discourse while in the economics of the West you find yourself 
in the South. The Caribbean has never had a development program organized by those who have taken the wealth out of this region for centuries. Undoubtedly, the Caribbean is one of the most economically exploited parts of the world economy and has been for centuries. Indeed, the Caribbean remains a place where the decolonization process has halted. It is the only part of the world that still has a significant number of colonies. That process of democratizing, of seeking to remove itself from the south of the west to bring into alliance the political identity of being at the center of the west and to align the politics and the economics remains of course the big problem facing caribbean statesmen and stateswomen we know professor satch in fact the last time we met was in manhattan when the University of the West Indies joined with the State University of New York and launched a joint center, the UWI SUNY Center for Leadership for Sustainable Development. And Professor Satch was our, our guest speaker. Ironically, we were in Manhattan. Manhattan is an island, a small island. Manhattan occupies the place in the world economy today as a small island that Barbados occupied in the 17th century. It was a center of commercial and financial capital in the rising Atlantic economy in the 17th century. And these are linkages that we have to understand by historicizing our development process. And so the Caribbean has participated in all of these, what Kamau Brathwaite, our poet, has called contradictory omens, because it has committed itself to the democratic discourse, carving and nurturing democratic societies out of the rubble of colonization. It has been in the vanguard of the South-South discourse, another paradigm in search of economic justice for the world. It has been at the center of the anti-apartheid movement, and now it is at the center of the global reparations movement. All of these movements from the philosophical assumption of being at the center of the West, but seeking in order to bring economic justice to those parts of the world that have found themselves in the south of these structures. Our prime minister, has inherited these discourses. She is intuitively and intellectually fully understanding of them and is providing the leadership through this matrix into a world for political respect and economic justice. The Caribbean has paid its dues. The Caribbean remains a site of resistance. The Caribbean is calling for a special COVID and post-COVID carve out of investment and partnership in order to facilitate its emergence as a competitive part of the world economy. The Caribbean understands these historical paradigms and is seeking to create a new approach for this 21st century. But at the same time, it is coping with what we call the triple, the triple C, the devastation of the triple C, climate change, chronic diseases, COVID-19, constituting in themselves a cocktail designed to create an existential threat to the Caribbean civilization. This conversation, this, this motley sat conversation is therefore one of tremendous historic moment. Two of the finest minds in the world 
understanding and comprehending these circumstances will be providing us with a narrative. Locating the Caribbean within its proper historical context as the foundation for a new approach, a new vision for economic justice and political freedom. The University of the West Indies is honored to be hosts of these two intellectual giants and to share with the world, the global world, the fruit of this, of this engagement. This is no ordinary conversation. It's a special conversation. It's a relevant and pertinent conversation. It is the most important conversation facing all of us in the world today. How do these small island states, how do, they, how do we look at these post-colonial states and a globalized economy insisting upon a certain control over the world's resources and those parts of the world that have been integrated into globalization as colonies, the labor of the world through slavery and indenture. How do all of these people demanding their fair share and their fair dignity in this world, how do we proceed? What is the most effective path? What is the nature of resistance and partnership? How do we combine seemingly contradictory forces to achieve collaboration and, and justice? The University of the West Indies is honored to host this conversation. Thank you. What a tremendous honor and privilege it is Her Excellency Dame Sandra Mason, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, Sir Paul Altman, Chair of the Campus Council, Chair of tonight's proceedings, or this morning's proceedings, my apologies, Professor Don Marshall, Professor Clive Landis, Pro Vice Chancellor of the Board for Undergraduate Studies, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, members of Cabinet, Leader of the Opposition, members of the diplomatic corps, representatives of the University of the West Indies, specially invited guests, live streamed audience, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Professor Winston Moore, Deputy Principal here at the UWI Cayfield campus. I bring you greetings on behalf of the Principal and Pro Vice Chancellor, the Most Honorable Professor Eudine Barato, and colleagues here at the University of the West Indies Cayfield campus. You know, I received some really great advice when I first started at the Cayfield campus. Under no circumstances should one provide remarks or attempt to provide remarks after Professor Beckles. Now this morning, I'm providing remarks after Professor Beckles, and I need to speak to the organizer of this morning's proceedings. After today's session on the balcony, you know, we can have a, a very small talk, nothing too tedious. It's truly a pleasure for the Cable campus to host this Vice Chancellor's Forum. We are also very pleased that the Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, a very good friend of the UWI, is with us today. You know, the last time the Prime Minister was with us for a discussion, it was entitled A Conversation with the Prime Minister. The event drew a very large audience from staff and students. I'm sure the Prime Minister remembers that event very well. Prime Minister Motley is a champion of small states and the challenges they face on the international stage. We are therefore very happy to have her today. Prime, welcome, Prime Minister Motley. If we're going to share um, our Prime Minister with someone, we're very happy to share Prime Minister Motley with Professor Sachs. Today, she's joined with 
the director of the Center for Sustainable Bev Development at Columbia University. It's not often that economists receive international recognition, as we are not likely to be the life of any party. But Professor Sachs has indeed received international recognition for his work in the area of development and sustainability. Just two weeks ago, I was working on an article and I referenced one of Professor Sachs' most recent pieces of work, a very, entitled, um, very important piece entitled A Handbook of Green Finance, a topic quite familiar to the University of West Indies. And indeed, in most of these welcome remarks, I normally refer to the Cable campus as a smart, green campus for the 21st century. Given the tremendous amount of research that takes place on a campus in the era of greening, from economics to scientific research, the campus has done a significant amount of work in the era of green economics. Indeed, working with the government of Barbados, as well as UNET, the UWI Cable campus produced a green economy scope and study for Barbados, which identified opportunities for greening key industries in Barbados including tourism. We would, would have consulted with a variety of stakeholders in conducting the research, and one of the most interesting statements we received was from Mr. Roger Blackman, chairman of the Green Committee of the Barbados Chamber of Commerce and Industry at that time. And he said, looking beyond the environmental benefits, the green economy will also open business opportunities in areas such as green energy, water, waste management, low carbon transport and clean technologies. Sustainability and green industries are expected to be among the most significant business growth sectors of this century. I'm therefore pleased that we're having this discussion on sustainable island futures, a topic that is not just for academics, but touches every citizen in a small island developing states. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and do enjoy today's event. Thank you very much, Deputy Principal. At this juncture, I wish to, I'm smiling because it's, this is a culmination of months of hard work. So at this juncture, I wish to introduce our main speakers, both Prime Minister Mia Moore Motley and Professor Jeffrey Schatz to take to the stage. As they do, I'm gonna ask the Prime Minister to sit to my furthest right, and I'm going to ask Professor Sachs to sit immediately to my right. And as they do, I permit me to just acknowledge that the, one of the key organizing entities uh, for this event has been the Sir Arthur, is the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies, of which there are three units one at Mona, one at St. Augustine, and one here at Cayfield. So I also bring greetings on behalf of the research fellows of these three institutes, including the directors, professors, Audrey Henry Lee and Hamid Ghani. Uh, I also want to, at this point, acknowledge the role, the significant role played by the Prime Minister, her team, the Office of the Prime Minister, in assisting in facilitating this event. I also want to acknowledge the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University for also facilitating Professor Sat's participation in this event. And um, I would also, at this juncture, uh, acknowledge the Office of the Vice Chancellor and the Office of the Principal of Cafield Campus, which really was the uh, the office of the camp of the Cafield campus really principal the principal's office here really was a key conduit in ensuring that we could reach um, these very eminent persons and reach them with an the ease and a comfort to allow for this to unfold today. I keep saying an event because the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute is normally known for organizing the distinguished Arthur Lewis lecture. Uh, to pay tribute to the first black and only black Nobel Prize winner in economics, Arthur Lewis, William Arthur Lewis. And we do so annually. 
and through uh, conversation and advice from the vice chancellor, we decided that we would, beginning this year, have a singular distinguished Arthur Lewis event. Uh, this may be the first of a series of conversations of this kind, or we may have lectures as well, but we thought we would have the inaugural one Salisis lecture under the Vice Chancellor Forum featuring a conversation where it's different from the kind of usual public lecture. Uh, both participants are aware of what we ask. And uh, at this point, I think I should uh, give you some insight behind them. I'll begin with our dear Prime Minister, Prime Minister of Barbados, Honorable Mia Motley. She's the eighth Prime Minister of the country. She's not only the first woman to occupy high office following the general elections of May 24, 2018, she managed, she's also made history in terms of winning all 30 seats in our House of Assembly. She's an attorney at law, Queen's Council, and she's been active in the political life of Barbados for almost three decades. Certainly she's had at least 17 years of cabinet experience, the latter three years being prime minister. She serves in various portfolios in cabinet, first as Minister of Education and Culture, then as Attorney General and Minister of Home Affairs, and then as Minister of Economic Affairs. In 2003, she was appointed Deputy Prime Minister. She currently holds the portfolios of Minister of Finance, Economic Affairs, and Investment. And since becoming Prime Minister, she has served as the Chair of the Conference of Heads of Government of the Caribbean Community, CARICOM, between January 1st and June 30th, 2020. She's the lead and head of government within CARICOM with responsibility for the CARICOM single market and economy. She also serves as co-chair of a number of uh, important uh, processes and task forces, chair of the co-chair of the America's Cruise Tourism Task Force for the Caribbean, Mexico, Central, and South American markets. She's also co-chair of the Development Committee of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, and that is to run November 2020 to October this year. And she is also co-chair of the World Health Organization's Global Leaders Group on Anti-Microbial microbial Resistance. Uh, I also would wish to add that she has, in her short time, become a champion for small state recognition and small island development states issues. So we are likely to be well served with someone who not only has the requisite experience to address the issue, but someone who's dealing with the everyday sustainability management and leadership of a small island. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, he's a world-renowned economics professor, best-selling author, innovative educator, and global leader in sustainable development. Currently, he serves as the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, where he holds the rank of university professor. And he also held the position of director of the Earth Institute at said Columbia University between 2002 and 2016. He's president of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Uh, he's a commissioner of the UN Broadband Commission for Development. Uh, Sustainable Development Goals Advocate for UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. From 2001 until 2018, he served as Special Advisor to UN Secretaries General Kofi Annan, Ban Ki-moon, and Antonio Guterres. As a professor, he, you should be aware of some of his best-selling work, some of his leading uh, contributions to development theorizing. There's the End of Poverty, 2005. There is a, another manuscript he did, Commonwealth Economics for a Crowded Planet, 2008. There is also, uh, other books also include The Age of Sustainable Development, 2015. And I should also indicate that in 2020, he recently put out a book, The Ages of Globalization, Geography, Technology, and Institutions, 2020. 
2015, he received, he was co-recipient of the Blue, Pan Blue Planet Prize, the leading global prize for environmental leadership. And as I alluded earlier, he was twice named by Times Magazine, not only as one of the top 100 most influential world leaders, the New York Times would go on to refer to him as probably the most important economist in the world, and the praise goes on and on. The survey by The Economist ranks Sats as among the three most influential living economists. Ladies and gentlemen, we are well served. We have to be out of here, yes. We have to end by two, but we have enough time, considerable time to have an interactive engagement following the discussion, the conversation, the exchange. I have no idea how this will flow. Both of them have agreed to allow the dynamic to unfold. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you our two distinguished guests. You are to take the microphone. Uh, you can, I prefer you to hold it. Sorry, sorry to be so. <laughs> yes, and you too, Jeffrey. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Don. Um, Jeffrey, let me welcome you to Barbados. Um, I think that we agreed that I will first, but it would be invidious of me not to say welcome to our country and to welcome to this campus. I think Barbadians all over would want me to thank you for honoring us by coming. We've been reading your works and listening to you and wondering how a man who was not born of us can understand our issues so well. So I hand over to you at this stage and hope that we can start a conversation that will, more than anything else, kindle a passion in our young people to appreciate that what we are fighting is not a battle, but a relay race. And as I listen to Sir Hillary and as I listen to Don, I recall the role that Michael Manley and others on this campus, watching him articulate the battles that he was fighting along with Errol Barrow in the days when they were both in opposition and capable of reflecting what it was like to fight the titans of the world and to try to establish a new international economic order. So I contextualize this conversation as very much being part of a relay as opposed to a single battle. Jeffrey? Thank you so much, Prime Minister. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to UWI for uh, this wonderful occasion and for honoring me uh, and the warm welcome that you've given to our family. Uh, I am threatening you, we may just stay. Uh, your island is so beautiful and the people are so warm and wonderful. We're, we're thrilled to be here. And I'm very uh, delighted and honored to be with you, Prime Minister. You are doing a magnificent job in, in the midst of a tremendous, uh, unprecedented challenge of our time, COVID-19. Uh, you have had great success. We've experienced it uh, ourselves, the rigor of uh, uh, Barbadians in keeping this pandemic under control uh, from before we left to the moment we arrived to, through uh, every other step, the care, the diligence, uh, the attention, the testing, the hygiene is exactly right. And uh, you have created uh, an environment in which this gets done. I lived in a kind of nut house in the United States under Donald Trump. Uh, it's quite different when you don't have a leader as wonderful as your prime minister. We had a psychopath. Uh, and uh, he's gone. Uh, but we still have a lot of psychopathy uh, in our country. Uh, and it's so nice to be here where uh, the intelligent things are being done. You know your mortality rate in this country from COVID is less than one-tenth of the United States. That is a tremendous accomplishment. I, I know how much the Prime Minister is appreciated, but I want to appreciate her uh, for this moment. Her, her leadership is not only wonderful, but it has saved a lot of lives on this island. 
Uh, and I think we should thank her for that if, if we could. Thank you, but let me thank all of Barbados because if ever there was an effort that required everyone, it is this effort. And it is really the people of this nation that have made us proud, but thank you. It's, it's really true, and uh, if I might just uh, riff on that for one moment, uh, you can't control a pandemic without social capital, without social cohesion, without people trusting each other, without people acting together, without people behaving, uh, behaving normally. We don't have that in the United States right now. We have insurrections, we have people yelling at each other, shooting each other over questions of masks. It's a kind of crazy country at a, at a very difficult moment. But it's also true, Prime Minister, I'm going to insist that the quality of leadership makes a big difference in the nature of the public's reaction. And I, I do want to say, I think it's scientifically provable that women have been better leaders during this period than men systematically. I will give you a biased uh, sample. Uh, Trump, Bolsonaro, AMLO, Boris Johnson. There are no women in that list. You know what that list represents? Nahendra Modi. That list represents the countries at the top of the world in deaths. Because not one of those leaders took this appropriately. Not one of them. And all of them, Brazil, 500,000 deaths. The United States, 600,000 deaths. India, officially, about 300,000, but my Indian epidemiology colleagues tell me it's maybe five or ten times more because of underreporting of deaths in the countryside. Many of those leaders got sick because they weren't taking precaution and they were telling others, don't worry about it, it's nothing. And then catastrophe in those countries. Then I compare with you, but I'll add in uh, Jacinda Ardern uh, of New Zealand who went for months in New Zealand with not one case because they took it seriously. Another two islands there uh, in New Zealand. And it's interesting, uh, I often praise the Nordic countries. There are five of them. Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, and Finland. It happens that four of them have women leaders, women prime ministers. That's, first of all, not an accident, because they're well-governed countries. But if you rank them, the one with the man had death rates more than twice the next one and almost 10 times the others. That was Sweden, which is a little odd. Yeah. He lost a vote of confidence today, by the way. Yeah. Uh, the other four are very popular. So I don't think that it's an accident. I'm rooting for more women leaders, first of all, as a general matter. <laughs> and I'm wondering whether, for the men here, whether our side of the species can learn something to behave because too many of the leaders don't. And to put it very seriously, what we need more than anything in our countries and in the world is cooperation. And yet there's a, a brand of politics like America First, which on its face is, a, is dangerous. But the divisive politics, the politics I'm gonna club you over the head, uh, the politics that's winner take all, the politics of Cold War, which the United States is provoking with China right now. This is the biggest danger that the world faces because all of the issues that we are going to discuss and that the Vice Chancellor raised in his uh, very eloquent statement cannot be solved by confrontation they will just get us deeper into the mess. And so for me, especially now, this is my 21st year of working with the United Nations continuously, 
They owe me 21 bucks, by the way. Uh, I work for a dollar a year uh, for the UN. They haven't paid that dollar yet, so, uh, but that's all right. I'm still uh, giving, giving them credit for it. But seriously, I regard the UN as our greatest hope because it's the rule-based international system. Uh, it is the system of diplomacy, which I adore, because diplomacy means people talk to each other even if they come from places that don't cooperate well with each other, they talk, which is so important. But we're at an extraordinarily fragile time, which I think is why I know what you say will be very important. I hope I can add something. Uh, but what the Vice Chancellor mentioned is not hyperbole in general. The discussions that we're having these days in the world are really consequential. I think they're the most consequential discussions that the world will have had since the end of World War II. Because the end of World War II was, of course, uh, a, a moment of history that required fundamental reorientation. And one of the good things that happened then, one of the best things that happened then was the adoption, the, uh, formation of the UN. I'm proud to say uh, this was uh, the work of the greatest American president, Franklin Roosevelt, to a very large extent, his vision. Uh, many difficult things happened at the same moment, starting the, the Cold War with the Soviet Union. We're probably at a similar point in history right now, where the number of tectonic plates moving in the world are shifting things so dramatically that unless we are able to take a cooperative perspective on them, we will lose not only a historic opportunity, but tremendously endanger ourselves and the whole world. And so if I might, just a couple of quick observations why I think that, and then I uh, would love to hear your perspective uh, on, on that, of course. First, technologically, we're in a remarkable acceleration. We've gone to a digital world, almost, it seems, almost overnight. Of course, the buildup was, was uh, more gradual, but within a year, we're in a, a digital age. This is the distinguished Arthur Lewis virtual event. That wouldn't have even been meaningful a year ago. What do you mean a virtual event? Now it's a commonplace. And that is changing the world, it's changing jobs, it's changing work, it's changing transport, it's changing where people live. The idea come here and live in Barbados and work anywhere in the world is perfectly realistic uh, and sounds like a great idea to me. Uh, so this is one, one point. Second, geopolitics obviously is changing. The rise of China is a a uh, world-changing event. To my mind, a very positive one, by the way, not a negative one. To the policymakers in Washington, a horrifying one. That's because the policymakers in Washington have one very bad idea, that the world is a zero-sum struggle, and if someone else is rising, it must hurt the United States. That's a kind of insanity to believe that, by the way. That's a belief that you are chosen and everyone else has to follow you. And if you follow that, the world is extremely dangerous. But the rise of China is a major event. It's 20% of the world's population. It's a great civilization. It's a civilization 10 times older than the United States, obviously, uh, which is a little bit more than 200 years old. And China is well over 2,000 years as a great civilization. So I'm very happy with China's development. I think it's a great and promising development for the world, but it is shifting geopolitics tremendously. Even the mere fact that Barbados is friendly with China, oh, oh, Washington doesn't know what to do about that. Are you kidding? You can't have more than one friend? But that's part of the difficulty of the mindset right now. By the way, the United States tried to crush Huawei, a very good manufacturer of 5G, 
And then the story on the front page of the, Wash of the uh, Wall Street Journal today is U.S. attack on Huawei opens opportunities for many U.S. companies. Well, duh. This is not playing by rules. This is street fighting of the ugliest and most dangerous kind. All under the name of big principles, because when you're the most powerful, you get to say what's principled. So that's the second big tectonic shift. The third one we all know about. The morning I arrived, I got up at 5.30 a.m. for morning Barbados and uh, was happy to be on the show. And the story just before uh, I was interviewed was uh, about coastal uh, protection and resilience in Barbados because of climate change. Rising sea levels, massive storms. By the way, we arrived and then there was that huge storm we opened, the, I thought it was every night in Barbados. <laughs> what did I know? It just seemed like, well, here we are. Uh, but in any event, I know it was an extraordinary storm in retrospect. Uh, but there will be more powerful hurricanes hitting the Caribbean. No fault of the Caribbean, of course. All due to the continued reckless promotion of fossil fuels by the rich countries, knowingly, more than 30 years, or 30 years after signing the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So all of the environmental shocks ahead are also part of these moving tectonic plates that we face right now. The United States is obviously in a deep transformation because a white supremacist culture is past due. You know, it's stale, but they're trying to hold on. And that's what Trump was all about. And our demography is changing, thank goodness, and the mindsets are changing, but the Republicans till this day are trying across 47 states in the country to put in voter suppression laws because that's what they understand from American history suppress minority votes and maybe the whites can keep in power. And so this is also part of what's going on right now, why the United States is so unstable. Because we're in the midst of a demographic change in a good way. And the young generation with much better ideas than the old generation. But it's very tense right now in the United States, very unstable right down the line. Mitch McConnell, nasty man, descendant of slaveholders, without shame, trying to block the reforms that we need. So we're unstable as well. Well, it's a complicated situation. I've been in development economics 41 years. I've never experienced anything like this, and I was at the center of the 1989 to 92 revolutions in Central and Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. I was an advisor to Boris Yeltsin. I was an advisor to the Polish Solidarity. That seems modest compared to all the shocks we're feeling now. And so that's why we really need to gain perspective and really work out a way to achieve what we have promised we believe in, sustainable development, which means socially inclusive development that is environmentally sustainable. And that's the drama right now. Last word I'll say just this moment is uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres is a wonderful person, very bright, uh, really bright. Uh, very concerned, extremely decent. And the good news is by acclamation in the UN General Assembly a couple of days ago, he got his second term. This is wonderful. I know him well. There's not an ounce of cynicism in him. He's trying very hard. He knows the odds are not simple, 
but he's working very hard on this. I thank you for pausing at that point because both what you said at the beginning and how you ended brings us back to the reality that 76 years ago when the United Nations was formed, we didn't exist as a nation. And the majority of the world was still very much in colonies. It begs the question for us whether there ought not to be a serious revisit of the constitutional arrangements that affect or that have informed not just the United Nations, the Bretton Woods institutions, the WHO in 1948, all of them, largely because our perspective very often is not being captured sufficiently. And then our voice is not seriously reflected other than for the record. Um, and I say so conscious that we want a conversation and today is not by accident because it is only in the conversation that we get to express with the nuance how we feel and why we feel how we feel. So Hillary spoke in his, as you said, very eloquent um, introduction on the realities of the Caribbean facing three C's. I'd like to expand it to five C's and not three. Because it isn't just the climate crisis, it isn't just COVID-19, it isn't just the chronic non-communicable diseases, but it is first and foremost the consequences of colonialism to which he referred elsewhere in his address and for which there was no development compact at the time that we settled our independence arrangements. There was a development compact for slave owners when they ceased being slave owners. There was no development compact for a country upon independence. And the fifth one is also as a consequence of things not made within our civilization, but for which regrettably has been a major, major rebalancer, regrettably, in our civilization from modern settlement, and that is crime. Um, this region was forged in the crucibles of violence and crime when those who came decided to settle. Now I start with these five C's because in a very real sense, you can't pursue development as a nation state in the Caribbean without being conscious of the consequences of colonialism, both the absence of a development compact as well as the mental tyranny that was foisted on these countries for centuries. Hence, I still believe that the most important task of my generation is mental emancipation, largely championed by the lyrics of Bob Marley and his great song, Redemption Song, but, but, but owing its genesis to that of Marcus Garvey many, many decades before. And while we continue to be that location in the world that seeks justice, Hillary called it economic justice, we talk in our own way of economic enfranchisement, but we also talk about political respect and justice, largely because the events that brought us together were events that were driven by the greed of others. And we have had to fight the moral case for centuries. It is regrettable that as we go into the second and third generation of independence, too many of our small island states are still having to fight the moral case. And what is the moral case? The moral case is that which says that we ought as independent nations to have some policy flexibility, that we ought to have policy autonomy, that we ought to have um, elements of justice and the laws of natural justice require that we have a part and a role in the conversation. And if you believe that were the case, then you would say, well, Prime Minister, what's the position now that the G7 countries have settled on a 15% global minimum tax rate and I will have to answer well I've read it in the papers just like you <laughs> and that there has been no conversation 
in spite of the fact that about 3% of our GDP stands to be affected by decisions being made by the wealthiest countries in the world. Or you might ask, Prime Minister, what is the position with respect to your ability to respond to COVID, given the fact that there, are, there is clear record that the advanced economies of the world have practiced a level of quantitative easing that is unparalleled, and that is at the level of 12 or $13 trillion. But the debt service suspension initiative announced is in the vicinity of 12 billion as opposed to 12 trillion and that even at that 12 billion only 5 billion has been distributed to countries who are low-income countries but the middle-income countries are caught right in the middle largely because there is no framework to support the fact that middle-income countries also have been affected by COVID. And I kept this phone here largely because I really just wanted to quote the IMF World Economic Outlook for last year. Because this tells us all that we need to know. In the advanced economies, the worst performing advanced economy was the UK, and it was only at 9.9%. In the European area, the worst performing European country was 11%. Now notice that both the United Kingdom and Spain are probably two of the biggest tourism and travel dependent economies in Europe. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the worst ones are Mauritius at minus 15.8, Seychelles minus 13.4, and um, Cabo Verde as well at minus 14%. In emerging and developing Asia, the worst, Maldives, 32.2%. And if I come to the Caribbean, I don't need to tell you, the only country in Latin America and the Caribbean that grew last year was Guyana. But the worst news is that the countries that were all double digit, all rate from Antigua, Bahamas, Aruba at the highest end of minus 25.5%, down to Jamaica at minus 10.8, and of course Barbados, Bahamas, St. Lucia, all of the rest of us roughly at minus 17, minus 18. Now, this carries us back in nominal terms at least a decade, and in real terms, it is arguable possibly two decades. But yet, the global community is not prepared to settle a framework for middle-income countries but will only want to include those countries, tourism and travel dependent, that are low income countries. So there is no compact, there is no framework. Indeed, there is almost a penalization for managing your affairs well during the period of independence such that you move from low income to middle income to even upper middle income. But what is our reality? You experienced it last Wednesday night when you arrived that we could be subject to a storm that, as of yesterday morning, I'm now seeing there are 100 houses that have been affected, and the number keeps growing, that we have potentially before us a system that can reach here by Friday that is east-southeast of us, and that we pray will not be picking up any serious strengthening during the course of this week. But all of that speaks to living on the edge. Living on the edge, and we bring it to the fancy word, vulnerability. And for 30 years or more, one of my um, advisors, Professor Passard's father, when at the Commonwealth, was fighting for vulnerability index since 1989. In 1989, I had just started to practice law. In 1986, the United Nations settled that we had a right to development as an, inal an inalienable right. And we ask ourselves today, as small island developing states, how can we build our future if we, one, still cannot settle our right to development, two, still cannot reflect our reality, which is vulnerability, because as much as I may do well day by day by day by day, that which I face 
can take it all away from me within 24 hours. Now that is the definition of vulnerability. And there has to be something fundamentally immoral about a global community that is prepared to use proxies that are convenient to them and to economists and to bureaucrats, but bear no relationship to the quality of life of our citizens, which we set out to protect. Set out to protect in the Charter of the United Nations being established in 1945, set out to protect when the UN accepted that development is an, is an inalienable right, set out to protect each time we meet and each time we bring these high-sounding declarations, and each time we recognize that, that, that this is the way. Now, where is the problem? Like you, I have tremendous respect for the Secretary General of the United Nations, and I think all of us are absolutely happy that he has been reappointed by acclamation, because I think he has a moral center that the world needs more than ever. In his Nelson Mandela lecture last year, he spoke to the need of a new global compact and a new social partnership. And I smiled. Why? Because this country settled a social partnership back in the early 1990s. This country still has that social partnership. And to the extent that we were able to pull back our economic circumstances before the advent of COVID, it was largely as a result of us using, respecting, and working with that social partnership from the very first day that we took office as a government, where the mission at hand was the saving of the Barbados dollar first and foremost. How do we prevent its devaluation? And thereafter, the use of the social partnership to set national goals, national missions, I believe last week only in the Willie DeMass lecture that the CDB had, the reinforcement of settling missions to be able to trigger development was, was spoken at, at great length. But if we don't have the capacity to work together, as you just said at the end, then we are not going to see the levels of progress that we need. And, and, and regrettably, the biggest issue for us is going to be how do you treat to the unexplained interruption, the unexplained interruption of COVID with respect to debt in particular and fiscal space. And I'd like to hear you in a minute because we have been arguing for the last 18 months that not only do we need to have vulnerab vulnerability as a measurement to determine access to concessional funding, but we also need fiscal space. Because you can give me as much money as I want to borrow ahead of me, but if I can't touch it because I have no fiscal space, I can't do anything. <coughs> and, and therefore, the absence of fiscal space is as critical as the need to access concessional funding as middle-income countries. And a little-known fact by the world is that over 70% of the world's poor actually live in middle-income countries. So if you exclude middle-income small island states, or middle-income countries that have limited access to international capital markets in order to, to finance their development, then effectively what you've done is to park poverty and say poverty must grow again because you're not helping where the help is needed. And therefore, the absence of conversations, the absence of global cooperation, all of these things are conspiring to be able to carry us back decades rather than propel us forward. And, and I'm asking that against that backdrop, we would be interested in hearing your perspective as to how the world should treat to the COVID-related debt, particularly of tourism and travel-dependent countries, where the absence of revenue from tourists was almost complete, and where we've had to not only make up for the absence of additional purchasing power because of the absence of tourists, so it has affected your farmers, it has affected your merchants, it's affected your transport sector, it's affected every area of economic activity. And at the same time, we're still being required then to be able to pull out of our own resources to sustain protection for the vulnerable while sustaining protection for the productive sectors, etc. Now, our view is that that 
funding should almost be ring fenced and refinanced into long term debt in the same way that the British government was able to be able to find a way to treat to its war debt on a long term basis so that it could continue the effort of building back its country after the damage it sustained in the war. And, and it was two completely different missions requiring two completely different sets of money, but that if they had to carry the war debt at the same time as they were trying to rebuild their country, you would not see the Britain that you see today. Today, you're asking Caribbean countries and other small island developing states to carry the debt of the last 18 months, in some instances on top of high debt already, but to do so against the background that if we were forced to continue in this way, there'd be no fiscal space left for us to resume the development trajectory. And why? Because of a pandemic not caused by us and a climate crisis that continues to impose on us year by year additional obligations that we did not plan for. And let us go further. International organizations like the WTO that are formed that refuse to accept that a one-size-fits-all prescription does not work and that countries such as ours that have a contribution to global trade in goods of 0.0000% and global trade in services of 0.00001% can do little to distort the global market and hence to impose on us rules that have led to the destruction of our indigenous manufacturing sector and capacity to have any form of industrialization have been a cruel and unusual cut by a world that simply does not see small island states, does not hear small island states, and is not prepared to treat to us until we become a crisis, either in the form of migration or global insecurity or terrorism. I'd like to hear your views. Right on a lot that I've put there, but equally and most importantly, how do we treat to the COVID debt if we are to resume the development trajectory and your baby of the SDGs and MDGs? Thank you. Th thanks a lot, and, and that is indeed a lot on the table. And uh, let me try to take some, uh, some parts of that. First, uh, to say how weird and, uh, and uh, dangerous is the way that the uh, economy has responded to COVID. The super rich have gotten super richer beyond imagining precisely during this period. This morning, uh, Jeffrey Bezos' net worth uh, rose above $200 billion. That's the personal account, $201 billion as of this morning. The richest 10 people in the world have net worth of $1.3 trillion, 10 individuals, enough to put every child in school, give everybody electrification, give everybody health care, 10 people in the world. The richest 500 people who are listed daily, I'm a kind of billionaire voyeur, I have to tell you. Uh, I go on the Bloomberg.com website to look at how the billionaires are doing just fine, thank you. They are at around seven to eight billion dollars for the top five trillion, excuse me, for the top 500 people. So even if each of the 500 had a billion, which I'm told is you could get by with that, that would be 500 billion, but no, it's about 8 trillion because they have wealth that no human being, if, if they live for thousands of years, could, could, could uh, use. It's beyond belief and it's rising rapidly because the tech stocks and the uh, home delivery and the online portals soared in value 
and people in the front lines, in shops, in, uh, in daily life, lost jobs, lost income, uh, lost their livelihoods. So you would think, by the way, that say within the United States where we have a lot of poverty and super, 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 super wealth. Mr. Bezos, by the way, designed, manufactured, rides on a 500-foot super yacht. You'd think that we do something even within our own country. And it's interesting. President Biden has put on the table plans for infrastructure, and he says, let rich people and the big corporations pay for it. And the Republican Party says, no, not one penny will we accept of higher taxes on the rich or the companies. Why? Because the United States is a corrupt, plutocratic system, period. How do I know? Because the last campaign cycle involved around $14 billion of campaign contributions. That didn't come from the common person, I can tell you. That came from the big boys, and I say boys advisedly. First, they act like boys, and second, there aren't too many women in that category. And they own the political system right now. So that is a problem even within the ring-fenced United States. We don't even know whether Biden can get more of his legislation passed because the plutocrats are out in full force. The Republicans aren't saying, oh, we'll allow a little bit of raise or yeah, maybe 201 billion, I don't need all of that, thank you. They're saying not a penny. And so this is, even within a country, even when there are voters, of course, the American people by 70% to 30% want higher taxes on the rich. And if we were a democracy, that would happen. But we're a plutocracy because our politicians don't respond to the public will, they respond to the campaign contributions. And so we are not sure whether we can get this through. But how can you run a country under a constitution responding to the rich, not to the vote? Ah, that's where voter suppression comes in. That's been a very handy tool of America for almost all of its existence. Black people were denied the right to vote for almost all of American history. Poor people have been kept off the rolls for almost all of American history by one subterfuge or another. And it's done in broad daylight. It's a really weird country, I'm telling you. I know, I've lived there 66 years. I didn't think it was weird at the beginning because they didn't tell me any of this. You grow up in it, you think, well, that's my country. And you realize only over time because fortunately I've spent most of my career looking at the United States now from outside rather than in, and I see what an odd country it is. Dangerous to itself and dangerous to its neighbors, by the way, like you, because we're not well behaved. So this is a first point that I would stress. What makes this hard? I'm not giving up, but it makes it hard. Second point that makes it hard, you know, when, when uh, my wife and I started college, the favorite book at that moment was Love Story. I don't know if people still know that, that book, uh, but uh, since we went to Harvard and it took place at Harvard, this love story, everybody uh, watched it, and the line of the book was, uh, love means never having to say you're sorry. That is not the right line. The right line is power means never having to say you're sorry. So when it comes to this question about decolonization, the whole essence of decolonization and of the U.S. position, because the U.S. became the preeminent 
imperial power after Britain, was we will never apologize for the past. That's not an intellectual blockage. That is a rule of power. We will never apologize for the past. We will never apologize for the period of slavery. We will never apologize for the genocide against Native Americans. Because once you open that up, who knows where it's going to go? And so better just shut the discussion. So there was never discussion about what does the world owe? What do the imperial powers owe to the former colonies that they kept in virtual forced labor and with one decisive point of colonial rule, I don't know how it was in Barbados, but the general rule of colonialism was don't educate local people. That was the general principle of colonialism, which is more educated the, the subjects are, the more dangerous for the colony. And so many African colonies emerged from independence with five people with a high school degree. Uh, we, we were actually opposite and lucky because we were able to have, in 1900, we had 200 primary schools across 166 square miles. The problem is, is that the educational system that they gave us was set in the British reform of 1940s, which is that you only educate the top 30, 40% to the maximum of their ability, and the rest will find their way yeah. as they go along. And that is what we are confronting now and having to deconstruct. But it takes money to deconstruct it. And if you want to create schools of excellence in every area, you've got to be able to find the money to do so. We reintroduce the payment of fees at the university here in three years ago. It means, it means that we have to look every year for roughly about $145 million, 70, 72 million US dollars a year, or to put it in uh, as a percentage of GDP, probably about 1.6, 1.7% of GDP just to handle tertiary education. But why do we do it? Because we have a national compact that on this island we need to make as many people reach as high a limit as, high a limit as they can educationally because that is what is going to propel development for us. And I know that Sir Arthur Lewis was consumed with the unlimited supply of labor, but for us it really needs to be the unlimited supply of rare labor because it is only through rare skills that we are going to be able to push the value of what our people get paid as opposed to keeping them at the bottom of the gig economy that, that is so much a part of today's world. So we were slightly different, but not different enough. And we're trying to claim our future by being able to change that trajectory of educational reform, but it costs money. And if you have to be spending money fighting storms, fighting droughts, fighting all of these other things, then you don't have the fiscal space to do that which you ought to be doing in terms of education and healthcare and, and, and community development and the other things. So those are some of the battles that we fight and that's why it's not so much that we even want to have eyes in the back of our head as a result of our historic development, but it is the recognition that the world found it necessary after World War II to help rebuild Europe. The world found it necessary to allow the Britain to be able to, to, to do what it had to do in terms of the bonds. It is amazing that what is required to stabilize this part of the world as small island developing states is a fraction of what was used with the quantitative easing by the advanced economies of the world. It is almost like the, 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 the vaccines that are being allowed to expire in developed in the developed world where those people in the developing world have to watch people die simply because there's no access to vaccines. I'm saying that as I prepared for this conversation today, there's nothing new that you and I will say. Nothing. But what is new is the determination to have to call out wrong continuously now. Because our part of the world, or if we take the AOSIS countries, 46, 47 small island states, 
we have played by the rules. We have watched on, and we have done all that is necessary for us. We were promised the Warsaw Mechanism on loss and damage. It hasn't come. We were promised that $100 billion would be put into adaptation. They're fighting to put it in place by Glasgow when it should have been in place already. So that when you see all of these things and, 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 and you realize that the simple pleasures of wanting to pursue development rooted in education and healthcare and all of the things that we know as human beings we should want to do, all of that is being compromised by reason of these other events that we have to respond to, that we have little capital to respond to, that we had little intergenerational wealth from which to respond in the first place, and that what is required just simply to allow us to close this chapter is that conversation that says, look, let us put a development compact in place that will allow for a successful neighborhood even if you don't want to have successful countries, a successful neighborhood called the Americas. Let me give some thoughts about uh, some practical things that, that can be done. Uh, I do think because of the tumult that we're in and the fact when you read from the IMF report, the startling fact that rich countries have borrowed and spent to respond to COVID 15 trillion dollars, whereas poor countries have had to undergo austerity. So it's not as if the rich countries are tightening their belt and saying, well, you should too. Quite the contrary. The United States spent deficit spending, seven trillion dollars. That's a lot of money. Maybe not for those billionaires, but still a lot of money. Seven trillion dollars within 14 months from March 2020 to uh, May 2021. Yep. Now, why didn't the poor countries do it? Well, they're not credit worthy, quote unquote. And it was interesting uh, for me, I was on a call yesterday with the Danish cooperation minister in a Zoom meeting, and it was a meeting about Kenya so I looked it up. Denmark can borrow from the markets for 10 years, US dollar denominated at 0.1% interest. Kenya pays 9.8% yield. And we, and we can add Ghana and Greece to, to reinforce the same point. Yes. So here it's not even the same world. And by the way, it's, the U.S. has more debt, not less as a share of GDP. Why does the U.S., why can the rich countries borrow so much, so easily? Not because they're so responsible, but because they own the central banks in which the debts are issued. If you had the Fed, you could borrow too. So there's something that doesn't work about the international financial system. I've been studying this for almost 50 years. Money flows to those who have, not to those who don't have. Or to those who need. Or to those who, and still less to those who need. <laughs> and uh, a long time ago, the French said of the US that having the dollar as the world's currency was an exorbitant privilege that you were able to do things no one else could do. This is part of the mystery of this, not better behavior. Uh, obviously, the United States did not have better behavior or more credibility for that matter, or a lower debt ratio or more taxes to cover debt service. None of that. They have the Fed. They have the Federal Reserve Board. So this means that we need to have a Bretton Woods II meeting now. What does that mean in historical terms? In World War II, Roosevelt and Churchill realized that the old gold standard system 
was one of the reasons for the collapse of the European economies, the Great Depression, and the rise of Hitler. And so they were determined to create a new kind of financial system for the post-World War II period. And there was a meeting in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, at the Bretton Woods uh, Inn Hotel that was attended by the leading financial specialists of the day in 1944. And that established the post-World War II monetary framework and created the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And those structures have been in place and related structures have been in place now for 76 years. We haven't had another Bretton Woods type meeting since then. We need now a big think and a big rethink. And what I would suggest, Prime Minister, is the one thing that I observe at the UN for the last 21 years is that the voices of heads of state and government matter. Because the UN is, in its wonderful way, a place where you're represented. It matters. And Barbados's voice alone won't be sufficient. CARICOM's voice alone won't be sufficient. But CARICOM and the African Union and others will be powerful. Yep. The G77 plus China is powerful in this context. President Conde of Guinea called me a couple of weeks ago. He said he's just become head of the G77. He'd like my advice. My advice is a new Bretton Woods meeting uh, because I think that there is enough objective evidence that we can't get by simply with tactical maneuvers like what they call the the uh, DSSI. Yep. Focus on finance and we should get some heads of government there. And she said, fantastic. So I think you would be a wonderful uh, person to help lead that uh, discussion because first we need investment in the children. That's right. And there are hundreds of millions of children not in school right now. That's right. It's the Both biggest because tragedy. of COVID and poverty. Second, if I might, uh, Prime Minister, we need help for climate adaptation, for you, for the coastlines, for the vulnerability. This has been promised now since 2009 and never delivered. Yep. I can tell you stories about that hundred billion that was promised. It's shocking, a hundred billion dollars. That's nothing in this world for rich countries to make available to poor countries, including loans per year, but they haven't done it because they're not serious so far. Even though the climate crisis is as serious and existential as it gets. So we need climate adaptation, we need climate mitigation, because we need a zero carbon power system for the world. And fortunately Barbados can power 
all of Barbados and a lot more with the wind power you have. You have a lot of wind, especially offshore, which is low cost. You have sunshine. You've innovated in direct solar heating of uh, home water already, pioneered in that, actually. And so you could be 100% and will be, I have no doubt about it, but it needs financing. And then we need financing for digital because everybody needs 5G. As far as I'm concerned, Huawei would be great, by the way, or any other 5G. I just happen to know that Huawei makes a wonderful product. But the point is, we have a world where a certain part of the world is online and working from Barbados anywhere in the world. But the part of the world that's not online is falling hopelessly behind. Their children can't study. You can't get telemedicine. You can't get a license uh, of government services. This is a phenomenon around the world. So the Secretary General has called for universal access to digital services by 2030. I've studied the problem a bit. This is affordable and financeable, but not on the status quo. So my view is we need to call for a Bretton Woods for financing sustainable development in the world. That would include restructuring debts so that they don't become an overhang on the future. And one of my papers that I'm most proud of in my academic career was a paper called The Economics of the Debt Overhang in 1987, which described theoretically for the first time how an overhang of debt kills development. And it played into the HIPAA initiative and so on uh, 20 years ago. So debt restructuring, but even more important, is large-scale new capital flows for education, for adaptation, resiliency, decarbonization, and digital economy for everybody in the world, because then we have an inclusive world where every child is going to get a chance. And by the way, if the children learn, they'll have a chance. We don't know what kind of jobs they'll be in the future, but I guarantee you better educated children today will be the ones that will be able to earn the good livelihoods in the future. And that is why we need the education so much. Well, the financing doesn't add up right now. And the IMF, by the way, a gatekeeper, knows it. And I've been working with the managing director of the IMF. She's wonderful, Kristalina Georgieva, another great woman leader in the world. She knows it for sure. And her right. team has been working with me to calculate the gaps. The gaps are a few hundred billion dollars a year. Since I have a loud mouth, I go out and say, we have to close that. They're a little more reticent because they have the United States on their board. I don't. So I can say these things a little bit more easily than they can. But the point is, we can get this done. And to just uh, close one thought, say we needed to raise $500 billion a year for financing of investment in developing countries right now. Is that a big number or a little number? It depends if you're a macroeconomist or just us. But for a macroeconomist, it's not a big number. It's not a big number because the world economy is $100 trillion of output per year. So $500 billion is one half of 1% of the world economy. That's how I'm trained to think as a macroeconomist. One half of 1%, eh, not quite rounding error, but nothing to sweat over too much. And so, of course, we could mobilize $500 billion a year directed towards all of the 5 billion people in developing countries. 
even more than that, six billion is a better number. Of course we could do that and need to do that and will do that, by the way, because it would take profound acts of dishonesty to deny what is staring us in the face now, Absolutely. that this system is not working. It's broken, and, and I'm glad to hear you articulate the things that we need to be raising money. It coincides with our own development perspective nationally um, with respect to education, with respect to greening, with respect to climate adaptation. I mean, our major project we, could, we said, look, we don't want to do a series of small projects. We want to do projects that will be transformational. And that is how we came up with the concept of roofs to reefs. Because our roofs are at risk, as we learned last Wednesday night with the freak storm. And we have serious issues with our runoff, which is why we're trying to fix not just the South Coast Sewage Project and the Bridgetown one, but trying to test new theses as to how to be able to deal with the West Coast. Because if we built a traditional sewage treatment plant, that would be about five, six hundred million dollars. Whereas we may be able to use other mechanisms being suggested to us by our engineers, one of whom is in the audience, Dr. Seeley, um, and, and then tie that with the reverse osmosis in order to be able to augment supply ultimately. But the bottom line is that even as we are seeking to do these things regionally, you're absolutely correct that we need a new rethink of how the Bretton Woods institutions can be reformed to meet the needs of the day. To continue, and, and I'll give you an example, and the others laugh at me, including my foreign minister, every time I say it. To ask me to tell you whether I'm eligible for borrowing from you on the basis of per capita income that is two years old is asking me to take my blood pressure from two years ago to tell you whether I'm going to get a stroke today or not. <laughs> so we know it is wholly inappropriate. We know it is wrong. We know that the needs of the world in terms of skills and education is here. We know that we need to deal with digitization and the digital divide. My greatest fear is that in a country that closed the gap with education, that as we seek to move forward, if we have to deal with digital delivery of education, then we need instruments that are affordable for on a sustainable basis. So you can't give me an iPad or one of these. The majority of the world's children will not be able to afford it. But you need something that is literally capable of ensuring that the delivery of education to every child we had a saying for our green paper in education 30 years ago, each one matters. And the absence of that is what is causing problems. Now, I make the point because Sir Arthur Lewis was big on knowledge, wasn't he? And he felt that knowledge would help carry us over the line. But what he didn't realize is that we were going to be living in a world full of greedy people. And that it is not just knowledge that is needed now, but it is also ownership. And, and that is why in all that we're trying to do. Look, renewable energy has the capacity of not only saving us from the worst of the climate excesses, but it has the ability to level the playing field in terms of ownership and in terms of access to wealth in this country. And if we in the Caribbean don't use it as a leveler, then we will have lost the greatest opportunity given to us post-independence. And where are we seeking to do it in Barbados? One, the agricultural sector, sugar industry in particular, cannot survive without being linked to the renewable energy industry, largely because the profitability and from the scale of what we're farming is just too small. And, and, and when you combine that, with the rules that have been imposed on us by the World Trade Organization that prevent us from being able to protect our own food production sufficiently, then you have a problem. Now, why have we gone for UNCTAD? Because we need to carry a chair to the table. And if they're not going to give us a chair, in the words of Shirley Chisholm, we can bring a folding chair to the table. Why? Because we know firsthand that our farmers cannot compete year round without protection. But then we want our farmers to give us food when there's COVID or when there's a hurricane. 
So how do we expect them to be there for us if we're not prepared to protect them year-round? The only way we're going to protect them year-round is if the world starts to accept that food security for islands goes beyond the economics of the moment and that this is a fundamental right that countries that don't have access to larger markets easily, you need to be able to produce your own food. You need to be able to make the best use of your resources um, domestically, as Arthur pointed out for us again too. But there is not that appreciation either in terms of giving us those exceptions in the same way that we are not prepared to carve out for special and differential treatment for small states that have no negative impact on a global economy or global trade. We also need, in addition to that, to recognize that some of the other things that we have to protect in terms of being able to propel education. I don't know how we are going to get out of this moment without a dedicated 10 to 15 years of emphasis on education and training. And, and, and it's not just for the Haiti's of this world for which it is absolutely patently obvious, but it is for the countries like us who appear to have done well, but for whom there is still a bridge to cross if we are going to literally marry what we can transform and do in terms of the digital economy, but at the same time, the ethics that's necessary to root training and development in this world. And, and as I said, ownership matters so that here's where we're going. The sun, the wind, the sea, if it is oceans, all of that can help be that leveler to which I spoke just now. But if the governments don't require some level of participation or some level of protection for the local population, then you're just going to have foreign capital or local capital, for that matter, just literally crowd out the space that may be opportunities for other people. And it is against this background that we've said renewable energy, we need to have 30% participation at least for local players. And even within those local players, we need preferential feed-in tariffs for people who are just doing one megawatt, in other words, ordinary households, as opposed to just the large um, generators of, of renewable energy. And we are literally having to use policy instruments to level the playing field. And that's why I spoke earlier about the need for policy autonomy, because without the ability to craft policy as we see necessary to protect our people, we are then just simply going to literally not be able to meet the development needs of our population. Um, I gave you the example of agriculture earlier. We give you the example of medicinal cannabis too. For example, there are those who globally feel that they can bring in the investment and all of that. But equally, if you don't carry on, your, carry along your population, both in terms of the agronomy, and this is where the University of the West Indies becomes absolutely critical with research, but also with respect to how they participate. Because the average fellow that may want to participate may not yet be schooled in, in, in the appropriate rules of business. So government needs to establish a special purpose vehicle that can carry along others of its citizens to be able to carry them to the point where they can say, okay, I'll buy you back out, or I'll walk on my own now. But we have that leveling of the playing field as the entity that has capacity and that is not driven only by the maximization of corporate uh, profits, but is driven by the need for transparency and fairness with respect to our society. So I hope that we will use the opportunities being given to us to be able to create that platform for ownership and not just knowledge, and to recognize that in today's world, it is the combination of knowledge and ownership that is going to allow small island states to be able to reach to the next level. Now, that combined with the point that you made earlier, that our voice alone, our CARICOM's voice alone, will not be sufficient. And when we've seen the greatest movements in the post-colonial um, era, and I almost went to say pre-colonial too, because in fighting the battles, it comes when we partner across 
geographical regions so that we were able to fight the war for decolon decolonization when Africa, the Caribbean, Latin America, Asia all said enough is enough is enough. We were able to fight the war against apartheid when equally we came together. We were able to have a new arrangement with Europe, um, with Lome, when we came together. I am suggesting strongly, and that's why we've been doing so much work with the African Union, that's why we've been reaching out to other regions in the world through ECLAC. Um, we are at that point again, where the countries of the Caribbean, the countries of Africa, the small island states and countries of Asia, and, and, and in particular also the countries of Latin America, need to be able to come together to call for that reform of the global financial architecture and to call for the mobilization of resources for our countries that is not based on conditional access on a Washington consensus that is designed to fuel the benef and benefit a few greedy people, but that is intended to be able to remove poverty from this world. And if we can't, and what frightens me, if we can't seem to get it right purely on the issue of vaccines, which is so obvious as to why we need to have vaccines across the world, not simply to protect those who you want to help as an act of charity, but to protect yourself in the developed world as well, because the race against mutations means that you are liable to be at risk again if you don't have the whole world vaccinated. Now, if the world isn't getting it with vaccines, what confidence do we have it will get it with the global financial architecture? It's a battle, but I believe that it is one that we cannot walk away from. And I understand why people are frustrated, but believe you me, it is absolutely critical for us to get this right, cooperating with each other across the different geographical regions. Because in the same way that the world rises up in countries, countries have seen movements rise up, then I fear that globally, the rest of the world, particularly with the benefits that technology affords our young people and other people, that the rest of the world is going to coalesce around the need for absolute justice because the injustice is too heavy a burden for the rest of us to bear. And, and, and I hope that we can continue to work together against those backdrops of, of, of having to fight these big, big battles because there is no way Kenya should be borrowing at 9.8% when Denmark is borrowing at 0.1% or there is no way that Ghana should be paying five to 600 basis points more than Greece, whose record of, of, of fiscal um, difficulty is well known to the world, um, and who, with Ghana, didn't have that same record, but who are penalized simply because they don't have access to safe assets. They don't have the, uh, they don't have the European Central Bank behind them. And that's the point. Yeah. So the European Central Bank makes a difference in the same way that um, the U.S., because it's the reserve of the world, has the benefit of all of these cheap borrowing. And, and in truth and in fact, if the world had a different deal for these developing countries, they would be able to borrow far more to be able to do far greater things and, and not have the kind of inequity that we're seeing. So the inequity that is presenting itself in the advanced economies within the territorial boundaries, regrettably, is reflected globally in the global community as well. And it seems to be acceptable to them on both counts. And that's what concerns us. You give me three quick ideas, Prime Minister, if, uh, if I might. Uh, first, a general one on, on education. I, you're exactly right. Use every creative way to uh, create new models of education. Also, blending the digital. Because now students can study uh, in mixed settings, uh, different universities, UWI could partner with other universities, expanding the reach of programs, expanding uh, adult continuing education. Many fascinating things can be done now that really without the digital were a little bit harder to do. So this is one point. And as part of that, you will be able to develop uh, 
area, uh, have and deepen areas of great expertise in marine ecology or climatology or uh, other dimensions that the world will flock here, uh, both economically and, uh, Ooh, and, and which we're trying to do that now with, point co with coral reefs and and to have a major competition exactly. here that fights that that says look we have to pay forward by rebuilding our coral reefs globally. So the I Barbados think that can do that so many here. things to be done on that. Second uh, point: Please move quickly with your colleagues around the world. The Secretary General will issue a report on the future that we want, uh, he's mandated to do that this fall. Get this message in there. Uh, and I think it's very timely, very urgent. Every grouping uh, possible. And the third, it comes back to where I started, maybe the women leaders also. You, uh, uh, Jacinda Ardern, uh, the uh, Prime Minister of Finland, the Prime Minister of Denmark, you not only are our are, are world's women leaders, but you have a standing. You can say, we've done a good job, thank you. So we're going to say something, uh, because we've done a good job, a better job, frankly, and we need to make the point. And one of the things about, I think, that group, wherever they are, Sheikh Hasina in Bangladesh, all would join in this view. None of them represents a point of view that says for us but not for others. They're all very social democratic in ethos. They're all looking outward. They're all trying to solve global problems. And I think it could be compelling, mm -hmm. uh, by the way. Secretary General in his list of priorities said that gender equality is the greatest issue of our time. So, so the, the women, women leaders could say, Secretary, Secretary General, thank you very much. We would like to see a financial program that makes sense for the post-COVID world. I think we can really get there, but I wouldn't lose the momentum now because this could be the breakthrough. I appreciate that. I know that um, with the time that they've given us, um, I'm looking for Don. He's hovering. <laughs> You're ready for us or we have to take questions or that's it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I realize that um, as a cricketer that you were trying to come back in as a 12th man. Thank you very much. To say that again, this is me rich, this is me rewarding. We've received a deep education. The interactive engagement has begun. Troy, can you uh, come here? Come. And I say it's begun because we've received comments, loads of comments uh, via YouTube, via, different, via our different platforms. I think it's appropriate that we have a professor of economics at our University of the West Indies to moderate this, this aspect. Time is very limited. And I'm going to hand over now to Professor Troy Lord, Dean of the Faculty of Social Science. <clears throat> Good afternoon, colleagues. And in the interest of time, I'll just jump right in. Uh, we have a number of questions. I'll just give a few of them. Uh, this comes from a graduate student in Antigua. This is Professor Sachs. So it arose from Prime Minister's comment about limited fiscal space and the need for concessional financing for SIDS. So Professor Sachs, what are your views of China's patient lending approach as part of its Belt and Road foreign policy initiative of, China. of China's Belt and Road Initiative. What, what are your thoughts about their approach? I, I'm, in general, a fan of the Belt and Road Initiative. Right. Uh, I think it's very constructive. Uh, the G7 got jealous of it, so they announced their own uh, initiative last week. To me, it was a little bit like kids in the playground. They just couldn't play in the same playground together. So they said, okay, we'll make our own playground. Uh, but I would rather that the G7 and China say, yes, this is a good idea. We will join together to promote infrastructure around the world. But it basically comes to the same point that we've just been discussing. The Belt and Road Initiative is an initiative to expand the infrastructure of developing countries. That's good. 
and we should applaud that. The United States got afraid of it because, oh, that's something for China. That must be bad for us, which is, again, a rather primitive zero-sum thinking and a dangerous kind of thinking. That's why the G7 said, we'll do our own initiative. Okay, maybe if all sides agree we need initiatives, then what your prime minister and other world leaders will suggest is we need a global framework, and then we could get that globally done. Okay, thank you. Prime Minister, do you have any comment? No. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm full in agreement. The yeah. reality is that for us, it is, and I'm glad that Jeffrey used the word almost childish, because we're not going to borrow that which we don't need, right. and that which we can't afford to borrow. And whether it is as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, or whether it is from the North Atlantic countries who, quite frankly, have left a gaping hole in terms of development finance for the last few decades. Um, the bottom line is that we feel that there ought to be a serious development compact, as Jeffrey said in the main speeches just now, that will help us finance education, help us finance greening, help us finance digitization, help us finance poverty alleviation. And regrettably, we haven't been able to see the mobilization of that money for the climate alone and greening, far less for the education and the digitization. So I look forward to not just China, but the G7 and whosoever will, putting together a framework that allows us to be able to access funds at affordable rates in a way that allows us to pursue the normal development goals that any country would want to pursue. Okay, thank you. This question comes from Trinidad and Tobago. Given what's required in education, economic restructuring, and societal makeovers, is it necessary to revise the SDG targets beyond 2030? I think we better hurry to reach the goals in 2030. Though this has been a big setback, if we do the things we've been discussing, there could be really very fast forward motion because things can happen now faster than in the past, especially because of digital empowerment. So I don't want to change the uh, goalpost now because that'll make it too easy for rich countries to say, well, we don't have to do too much. This development will happen 20 years later. Uh, no. I want to keep the pressure up so that they really do what they need to do to help the whole world to develop. And I think that that's the reason right now not to focus on what can or can't be done by 2030, but rather to focus on the question, how do we dramatically accelerate? And if it was 15 billion, 15 trillion for the 1.2 billion people in the developed countries, what about the six plus billion people in the developing countries? Okay, thank you. And a final question, um, so we can wrap it up. This is to both of you. Um, now, I've heard you say it, certainly really, and you've made a point about the inadequacy of GDP, but yet it's still being used, certainly by UN and other inter international institutions, as a criteria for concessional financing. And so really, in, instead of GDP per capita, and we agree that it's a very flawed metric, what would you propose to be used instead? Are we suggesting that we don't use GDP per capita at all? We're not saying that. We're saying that in addition to whatever else you may want to use, in an ideal world, we would want a multidimensional vulnerability index. What we are, however, hearing is that we're not going to get that in immediacy. So we are pushing strong for vulnerability to be a key criterion in the overall mix, which we'll still have in some elements of GDP per capita. Um, for us not to do so would be to ignore our realities. And the mere fact that Secretary Mnuchin and Secretary Pompeo, when I chaired CARICOM last year, I wrote them asking once again that consideration be given for countries like Barbados and the Bahamas and others who were graduated from the World Bank, but who now, in the middle of a pandemic and a climate crisis, could, access, could not access concessional funding. 
they accepted the argument and agreed that we should be able to have access to it. And I think our matter goes before the World Bank Board um, this week. This week. After a, it took a whole year. And, and I want to say something quick on this too because there's a belief that you can do things normally in the middle of a war. When in truth and in fact, what matters in the middle of a war is time and speed. And that is why even in terms of some of the capital projects that we're doing, we've made the commitment that we're going to have to have expedited procurement, but we will lay all of the results before Parliament with any contract over a million dollars. Why? Because at the end of the day, if you spend the time trying to execute in a normal way, then you'll see the bodies outside lining up that have not benefited from the jobs or from being able to access food or whatever in the time. It is no different on some of these other issues. And I hope and pray that, that we begin to understand that the world in which we live does require exceptional access, does require new measurements, does require new criteria, and regrettably, they know to do it when it suits them. Because with the Financial Action Task Force, there are a number of countries that only find themselves now on the FATF's gray list because of the re, and you're smiling, Troy, <laughs> because of the redefinition of money supply from M2 to M3, which immediately catapulted a number of countries, Barbados, Jamaica, Ghana, Botswana, catapulted all of us into a new weight division that we were not prepared for. So how does it suit you to change definitions and proxies when it not suits you, but when we need it and when it is patently obvious, like with vulnerability, you're not doing it. When it is patently obvious, like the special and differential treatment, and then we hear, oh, the large developing countries don't want to allow special and differential treatment, um, and therefore the small island states can't get it. Well, the last time I checked, there is no doubt the difference between a small state like St. Kitts and a large country like India. The two are in completely different geographical and spatial places. And for the world to continue to believe that it can conflate um, those arguments is to do a serious moral disservice. And it is why then men like Professor Sachs and Pope Francis then have to be the voices of moral reasoning to the rest of the world. If, if I might just add, uh, all of these uh, terms of uh, concessional and preferential and so forth are so arbitrary the way that they're used. Because really, if Barbados, it's not even preferential, if Barbados could have the same terms that the US government has, that's not preferential, <laughs> that's just the same terms, your problems would not be here because you'd be borrowing for 30 years at 1.5% interest. So the problem is that the developing world faces such adverse terms that we're talking about partially overcoming that adversity. It's not really something preferential. It's the preferential is a few rich countries. That's preferential. Having your currency be the world currency, that's preferential. Being the euro currency, that's preferential. But what the developing countries are asking for isn't preferences or concessional, they're asking for fairness. For the same. If you can borrow at those rates, we want to borrow at those rates. And so I think the language needs to be re-examined in our Bretton Woods conference. Because in a new language, we'll be talking about how to ensure that all countries have access to the capital that they need for survival, resilience, prosperity, decarbonization, raising children. And if I may, Jeffrey, <coughs> It's not only that too, but for, for, for clarity, we have the largest issuance of natural disaster bonds in the world, Clause, bonds with natural disaster clauses. Yep. We did it because it makes sense. 
Because if an event happens, the first thing that the person who lent you the money is going to worry about is, am I going to be repaid? But if you have those clauses in there, the man just knows that if X trigger happens, then for two years, the debt, the capital is deferred and the interest is capitalized for two years. Um, two years interest is capitalized at the back end. Now, if ever there is a clause that creates certainty, it is that. So why do the IFIs, in particular the multilateral development banks and the regional development banks, as well as the, um, <coughs> the others, why do they resist what is the most obvious resolution of, 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 of obfuscation that there is? You are bringing clarity and certainty to a situation, but yet we cannot get the kind of movement that we need to see. And it shouldn't only be natural disasters, but we now learn that we should have had it for pandemics because when an event happens that so disrupts your capacity to earn, then you need a standstill with respect to debt in order for you to be able to meet the needs of the time. It's such a good idea and it is uh, so clear that I think it can be fully understood. I apologize for, I apologize, well, I can't really apologize for Donald Trump Ah, uh, it was awful for everybody, terrifying. Uh, but I apologize also for his treasury, which wasn't the swiftest. Uh, the, the treasury secretary, not very well informed, uh, not very well educated. He came from Wall Street. That uh, was not what he needed for conceptualization. But I'll just say a, a word about another great woman leader, I hope uh, not out of place, but uh, when I began studying economics, uh, I took my first graduate class 48 years ago. Wow. <laughs> and a young, uh, a young, brilliant first year professor walked into the class with a pile of notes uh, from Yale University and um, gave an incredible course which inspired me to become a macroeconomist. Um, that first year young professor was uh, Professor Janet Yellen, uh, who is now uh, our finance minister, uh, our secretary of treasury. So we'll discuss with her also. She's brilliant. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, you'll have a, a, a very wonderful conversation with her that was not just as fruitful as it might have been a couple of years ago. So there, I'm getting very optimistic in this conversation. Uh, I think there's a, a way forward. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Turn it back over to the master ceremonies. Thank you very much, Troy, and I think we deserve to applaud these two presenters again and again. We are at that juncture where we have to say, uh, sorry, it's come to an end. Uh, we are at the, the point where we're offering the vote of thanks, and I want to begin by paying tribute to the two presenters first. Again, we say thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you for spending the time, obviously, in reflecting on the, the theme. Uh, we gave you the theme, you ran with it. You be, uh, if I'm allowed to, to be frank, Prime Minister, at one point I sent you a message and which was to cut through all the protocol. Forgive me, Principal, I know you're watching it while you're quarantined. <laughs> Cut through all the protocol required where we have to communicate to the Prime Minister through the office of the principal. That is the protocol. But it came to a technical issue that I had to discuss with the production team here at the Arabar Center for Creative Imagination. Wonderful staff, wonderful people behind here, Carla, Nicole, Paula, others, take a bow. And it meant that I had to more or less map out what the format would look like. And uh, the Prime Minister responded immediately and um, made it very easy. It was just simply agreed, done, go ahead. And uh, that was 
that was magic because um, uh, to, to go through the formal procedures to, to outline what we wanted would, would, have been, would have taken some time. Professor Sachs, I also want to pay tribute like I've, I have done to the Office of the Prime Minister for, for, for facilitating this. I also want to pay tribute to you as well. You not only uh, work well with the team from the Office of the Prime Minister, uh, Savannah Pearson, when we contacted from our office, your uh, assistant was able to provide us with every bit of information we needed in the creation of the poster and other th um, aspects so associated. And again, I want to pay tribute to your team at Columbia University. I also want to pay tribute as well to the office of the principal, formerly the Vice Chancellor, based at regional headquarters as well, the staff there, the staff in the office of the principal, the staff also within the wider Cafield campus associated with making sure from security to all other aspects, technical and otherwise. They worked as a team. I saw the, the UE campus perform as a team in a way in which I don't necessarily in my day-to-day -day get to see. And I was extremely impressed, and thank you for making this possible. Uh, to members of the COVID unit team that came and were impressed that we were actually measuring the social distancing. <laughs> to you, I say, to you, I say, this is the UE way, this is the KFIL way, this is the, the way we operate. Uh, we follow the protocols very seriously. And um, to the interactive audience, I also wish to say thank you. Now, I want to also pay tribute to the office of the Governor General, who responded very quickly as well. Again, record time, and um, I want to say a special thank you, Her Excellency. And, uh